I'm Steve Monroe, and I play Scott Proctor on the CW's Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and you're listening to the Movie Raid. It's time for the Movie Raid, and tonight's victim is actor, comedian, Stephen Monroe, that played in countless TV shows as well as films, Miss Congeniality as being one of them, a Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, The Following, tons of other stuff. Hello. Hello. Hey, thanks for having me on your show, Mike. I, I so appreciate it. Always a pleasure. So what's going on this year for you? Right. Uh, it's, it's been a great year, and I uh, am working on season three of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. I'm in a show called Major Crimes, and I'm in a two upcoming movies, among them uh, a Coen Brothers movie called Suburbicon, scheduled to be released in November this year, directed by George Clooney, and then I have another movie called Full Spirit coming out. Grateful to be working. Uh, the new roles that you are playing, uh, the films that you just mentioned, are any of these new roles a uh, real point of interest or and unique to you uh, compared to other roles that you've played in the past? I would suggest they're all right in my wheelhouse. I, I typically play kind of the offbeat, supporting Charactery, friend, or cop, or rent a cop, you know, goofball husband, father, but more, more kind of quirky, left of center characters. And actually, each each one of these characters in, in the shows I mentioned fit right into that uh, model. And knowing that, outside of acting world, you're also a counselor in some ways, for in terms of marriage and, and so forth. Has this actually changed your acting or even improved it a little bit? Yeah. Uh, Mike, you know, yeah, I, I have a marriage and family therapy practice uh, out here in Los Angeles. The answer, the short answer to your question is, uh, yeah. The common ground between acting and psychotherapy is that they're both character studies. They both, the currency, it's human emotion, so to speak. And the, the difference, the big difference, however, is one is about cameras on me, so to speak, and, and in the other therapy, it's about you. It's about the client. I have to say, much as I enjoy acting, I love acting, I, I relish the hour-long vacations from myself, so to speak, when I'm meeting with a client, and, I, and I'm able to just put myself in their shoes and, and look through their eyes and the world that they're experiencing. I find it a really um, great way to exercise the empathy muscle, so to speak, that serves me both as an actor as well as a therapist. So it's almost like a double mirror that you're stepping into from one acting and you go into this practice and then uh, you're almost enhancing as well as learn at the same time. Well put. Absolutely. I, I invariably uh, learn from my clients and I'm able to understand through their experiences and, and perceptions new things about the world and that, that can enrich my empathy uh, muscle. It can enrich my, my own kind of uh, emotional vocabulary, so to speak, that I can use in my acting. So absolutely, they're kind of symbiotic, you will, enriching one another and feeding off one another. Sure. Yeah, and, and, and when it comes to acting, there's also distractions as well. Um, when performing, what do you think should be eliminated in order to stay focused on the role? What do I think is necessary to stay focused on a role? Preparation is a big, is a huge part of it. I, an actor really bring a character to life and avoid uh, all too easy distractions from, you know, one of the uh, other actors or production assistants sneezing off stage or someone's phone ringing while you're trying to, you know, work up some tears or something. Uh, preparation is learn my lines like the back of my hand so that I'm not an actor searching for a word so much as I am able to then invest in what's underneath the words. What what are the what are the motivations, the the impetus that drives the character uh, beneath the words? Learning lines, the the busy work. That's where I really feel in the preparation, uh, an actor succeeds or fails. Sweat the uh, he or she puts into the the time before they roll camera. Yeah, it's not just simply reading a couple paragraphs from a character or so forth. I mean, you really have to dive into this character. And, and you look at these new movies that keep going. They're very rapid. They're very fast. And you can't even understand the character at least a little bit or at least to get an idea because, I mean, you can't even really appreciate the acting of the actor that's doing the character because it's so rapid in the scene and then move on to the next scene. And it's like, what? Well, you missed it. Well, that's a good, that's a good, uh, interesting observation. And a lot of times, yes, the, the rapid fire dialogue can be a, can be distracting if it's not used effectively and if the actors are not underneath the characters. 
if the actors are, are good enough, you'll know what what is driving them to at that pace, at that breakneck speed to get the lines out, whatever the urgency is or, or what have you. The lines become almost irrelevant uh, if the actor has in, has created a rich inner life of the character that is driving whatever pace their, the dialogue is. It, it becomes almost that the lines are incidental. But if an actor is simply just, just rapid fire saying the lines without motivating it from an inner, inner, a rich inner world for the character, then, then I, you're absolutely right. You're like, what's going on here? Why? Uh, and part of it is the, the studio. I mean, I understand they want to make their money. I understand they want to make a, a decent product. But again, even that is just so rapid to the point where, okay, let's move along. Next, next scene, next scene. And it used to be to the point where we could dwell into these characters you know we we weep for these characters we we root for these characters yeah. and it becomes more and more less than more unfortunately yeah that's interesting i appreciate your perspective it's not something particularly that i've observed but except in so far as uh, a key difference between comedies and drama drama emphasis is on what happens between the lines in the pauses during the pauses the, the emotion the emotional exchange between the lines comedy the emphasis the actions are on the lines so i wonder if perhaps a difference between the two genres might speak to some of what you're observing there's just so many combinations in between the drama the comedy or any any particular genre or form of of emotion and i mean it can backfire it's like one big stew uh you just uh, you have to experiment with it but at the same time you gotta be careful and but again you got all this around you you've got you got the studio on your back you got director on your back you got all this pressure and and whatnot and trying to get that stress out without having to you know blow your character without you know being unbelievable so to speak right right i hear you and and absolutely the number the artistic committee can really compromise an artistic vision when when everybody has input and different people want different things, sometimes the result is a whitewash of, of what was really intended by the writer, and um, as well as the bottom line of money and getting it in under budget and on schedule. There's so many forces, you're right, that, that end up perhaps compromising the execution of whatever the project is and and can make it, can leave it messy. And oftentimes you see, I'm not big on the whole reading the movie reviews uh, afterwards and when the movie's released and stuff, but when you do read it, it's normally either a mixed reaction or a very negative reaction. And th sometimes you wonder, it's like, these studios need to slow down on this. So otherwise your, your, per your product is just simply going to go to crap. You know, it's an interesting, and I, I um, my my perception is more about the critic. Like everybody's a critic, and it's easy to, to sit there and judge, and, and so many of the movies that I've enjoyed have been panned by the critics, and it's like, it leaves me questioning, really, the temperament of someone who, who uh, finds joy in sitting down and routinely just viewing, you know, people's efforts and art. Uh, and I, I, I sometimes wonder, do some of these critics ever find any joy in what they're watching? Or is it simply, you know... And trying to boost their own ego. ego. <laughs> Just because... Right, yeah, it, yeah, because they're a part of this company and and uh, or magazine or whatever. I mean, it, it's often off and on. I mean, sometimes you you can agree with them, and then oftentimes it's like, well, it's not that bad of a movie. I mean, you point this, it's like that's not bad. That's not bad. And I mean, you really can't compare it to millions of other films between the last ten years to compare to the next three years. <laughs> Right, and you know, and I like I'll look at Rotten Tomatoes before I, uh, I pick a uh, like a movie to watch with my wife at home or something. And a lot of the movies I like, you know, are just stupid, funny movies. Like uh, my wife and I watched uh, Chips the other night. That the movie, the new Chips with Dash Shepard. Yeah, and, uh, I think, my, and uh, people people are like talking about it as if as if the writers and producer as they're as if they're. They're posturing like they're Shakespeare, like they're putting on a Shakespeare uh, production. It's, it's just put that fun. Just relax, sit back, and lighten up and have some just some ridiculous laughs. Because, dude, we, I had a great time. I thought it was so funny. But there are a lot of critics who are, well, you know, they, they have all this beautiful, beautifully articulated, flowery language to just find fault with something that is not, not uh, out there to be under intense scrutiny like a Shakespeare production. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a self-aggrandizement, self-congratulation. 
congratulatory kind of uh, ambition that these uh, a lot of the critics have uh, because they know they wield some power if they can influence a, a movie's Rotten Tomatoes score and then people are beholden to them. You know, it's, it's really a, an empty exercise ego. Yeah, change is not a bad thing in film or television. It truly is not. But with all these reboots, like recently, just constantly, do you think the audience may think negatively toward film itself or even change the actors as well? There, there's a point at which art needs to be uh, done. Knowing when to walk away from something is from a work of art is an exercise in real uh, discretion in terms of, you know, remaking something that perhaps in its original form was already really just remarkable. Leave it alone. Let's not let's not rehash it all and make it in our own image. It, it can it can leave an audience yeah feeling insulted and disappointed when when the remakes try to top the original and and then just, there's just one remake and reboot after another. Leave it alone, you know. Come up with something original. Yeah, and the reason why I mentioned actors being involved with these, let's say they're in a remake, right, and they do well in this remake. And then they get asked on another different remake. The thing is, the audience is not going to really look at this actor as from an artistic point because they're like, oh, great, another remake. They're not going to look at this guy or, or this woman, and they're just going to simply ignore it. It's like, great, it's trash. Yeah, it's, it's hard. An actor, and I don't begrudge any actor who's doing remakes, considering the difficulty in uh, the acting world uh, and getting booking jobs, considering that difficulty. So... There's no no begrudging actors who do it. I, it's more to me about you know producers and the writers. What's that make sense? Like an actor's got an act, got to act. It's hard enough to book a job out here. That if, if they're doing remakes, well, more power to them. Good for for him or her. You know. Do you think more financial stability? Do you think it's better with television, or do you think film could be better? Well, that's a good question. And I it, it used to be that you know television actors were considered second rate when it came to movies, you know, the movie film actors were regarded as the uh, uh, the uh, cream of the crop, but, and, and TV actors were second class. But uh, my experience is that getting on a good show or a show uh, on TV lends itself to uh, more financial stability, mm -hmm. more regular, it's more regular work. If, you, if you're a series regular or a recurring character, you can really explore so many different aspects over the course of months and years even, depending upon the length of a series, and just discover so much more about a character and, and uh, really uh, mine the emotional depth to yield some really rich and interesting aspects of the character over a longer period of time, a movie would perhaps afford. Now, is there anything that you can tell us, new characters that you have, of your new films, or anything that you can tell us a little bit, a little bit more when we're going to see these films, or any new other details from your other project? Sure, absolutely. I'm in the movie School Spirits. I play a music teacher for some students who have uncovered some, some paranormal activity in, in uh, the school. And so that, that's that's an independent movie that has has a release date to be determined. Um, but it's, it's a really exciting story and, and, and what I understand. I haven't seen the finished product, but uh, other than that, I, I'm excited about Suburbicon, the Coen Brothers movie, and I don't want to give it, be a, uh, you know, spoil it, but uh, I play a male man uh, in, in 1950s suburbia, suburban town, and uh, I open the movie and uh, introduce a number of characters. The, the story centers around. So I've got that. As far as uh, Scott Proctor on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, season three, and my character is reinvesting in his relationship with his wife after having had uh, an affair. So it's uh, it's proving to be a pretty exciting, very uh, funny show. And it, it's a cast that I'm proud to work with. And the crew, it's just, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. It's, it's a great cast and crew, and they're so warm and welcome. Right. Just, those are some thumbnail sketches of a uh, couple of the characters and the projects that I could offer. All right. Is there any links that you want to share? Any links. You can follow me on Twitter, evemo333, T-E-V-E-M-O, number is 333. And you can uh, look me up on Facebook, actor Steve Monroe. And other than that, uh, I have a psychotherapy webpage, evenmonroe.net, S-T-E-V-E-N, M-O-N-R-O-E, dot. 
I'm happy to uh, hear from you. And if you uh, like me on Facebook and Twitter, I'd be honored. Yes, that is actor Steve Monroe, as well as comedian. That's right. Thank you, uh, Mike. This has been a real pleasure. I, I'm really grateful that you asked me and you thought of me. And I've had a great time chatting with you. So thank you so much. Anytime, anytime.